Uh, I will now introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Warrow. Hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Thank you, sir. Uh, this session is sponsored by Texas A&M University Press. Thank you to them. Uh, Professor Waro was educated at Brown and Yale and is professor of history and director of the Military History Center at the University of North Texas. From 2000 to 2005, he was, at the, he was a professor of st strategic studies at the Naval War College. Uh, he has written five books and is working on a sixth on the silent, slain, allied collapse and America's defeat of Germany in 1918. And he is also a co-editor of 30 volumes of the Cambridge Military Histories and is a member of the History Book Club Review Board. Dr. Waro will talk about some fresh, fresh perspectives on World War I. Uh, please help me in welcoming him. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone, um, and uh, thanks for turning out and, uh, on a football Saturday, but this is, there's no games on right now, so I, I guess we can all focus on, on World War I for the time being. Uh, fresh perspectives, I'd like to talk a little bit about this book that I have coming out that um, is called The Silent Slain, Allied Collapse, and America's Defeat of Germany in World War I. Now, as the subtitle, uh, as the, as the subtitle suggests, the, um, we often don't recognize that the, uh, that the Americans beat the Germans in World War I. It's commonly you know, understood that uh, that was a British and French affair and that the Americans made sort of peripheral contributions. And so the, the, the thrust of the talk today is I want, when I talk about fresh perspectives, I want to talk about a couple of new things that I think haven't been adequately fleshed out by historians until now, and that is um, you know, the extent of the Allied collapse when the Americans got in the war. Um, and that's one thing, and then the other thing is the extent of the American contribution to Allied victory, which is often uh, derided or minimized uh, uh, in efforts to bulk up the efforts of the British and French national armies in the end game. And then there's a lot of reasons for this, you know, larger reasons having to do with, for example, that French di France didn't do so well in World War II, so they look fondly back on World War I as their finest hour in many ways, so, but if you, as we'll see today, they, they, were, uh, they were having some great difficulties, and it had the U.S. not intervened, it would have been a catastrophic situation for France. So they would have had the, their fate in uh, World War II reprised in World War I. So, uh, essential background. I mean, this is the map of Europe in 1917, and it was really the high water mark of the central powers, Germany, Austria, Bulgaria, Ottoman Empire. Uh, they are, you know, winning on every front. The, the Turks are pressing the Russians in the Caucasus, and they're pressing the British in Palestine and Egypt. The Bulgarians dominate the Balkans. They've conquered all the, uh, all, all the uh, Balkan states allied with the Allies, like Romania and Serbia. The Austro-Hungarians are holding their own, and the Germans as well. On the Russian front, you're seeing the beginning of an epic collapse. Uh, the Russians, by 1917, have suffered five million killed and wounded. And the cost of living and uh, everything else is just out of control. There's shortages of everything, including bread. So you're seeing a, a, a revolutionary situation, which is spanning the entire year 1917. You have this provisional government under Kerensky in February of 1917, and then it culminates ultimately in the Bolshevik takeover in November of 1917. But the whole year of 1917 is a revolutionary year for Russia. And for the Allies, Britain and France, they look at Russia, and Russia is an, is a, is an absolutely essential player because they have 225 divisions. There's as many divisions in the Russian army as in the entire German army. And uh, the only reason they haven't been able to win is because their infrastructure is kind of poor. They don't have enough artillery, not enough machine guns. Their peasant levies aren't sufficiently trained. But they are the famous uh, you know, Russian steamroller. They have the manpower to draw off a big chunk of German and Austro-Hungarian manpower. If they're removed from the equation, then you know, the Allies look you know, to 1918 and say, how are we going to win? Uh, 
And then you look down on the, uh, you look down at the, um, let's see how this works. There we go. <laughs> Technology. Okay, I see my, well, anyway, it's not showing up. But um, look at, uh, the, everybody knows where Italy is. The Italian front, you know, the Italians by, they joined the war on the side of the Allies in 1915. And by uh, 1917, the Italians have 700,000 casualties, 700,000 casualties, and, uh, which is a lot for a power that's generally referred to as the least of the great powers. And they fought, at, to, to this point, they fought 11 battles of the Isonzo, the Isonzo River being, it's today in Slovenia, it's the border between Italy and Slovenia. And the in the last one, the 11th, was touted as being the war winner. And of course, they fail in 1917 to break through and win more massive casualties. So the Italians are really teetering on the brink of dropping out of the war. A lot of people on the, uh, you know, a lot of people worry in, in Paris and London. So the situation with the Italians is not good. Then you have the, 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 the stalwarts of the alliance, the France and Britain. In France, you know, you're looking at a situation by 1917 in which they've had three million casualties. Three million casualties uh, killed and wounded in a, in a power that um, has a population of 38 million. Uh, you know, half the population of Germany. And so that France in the war has the highest per capita casualties of all. And they're constantly, you know, kind of trying to find manpower for this war, and they're not finding it because they, 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 they had a million casualties in 1914, 1 1.9 million casualties uh, in 1915-16. In so they, they've scraped the bottom of the um, demographic barrel. They've basically gone through all the sort of good, healthy manpower, people that are phys physically meet the requirements, mentally meet the requirements, and they literally, by 1917, they are recruiting criminals, old men, boys, uh, you, know, you know, 16, 17-year-old boys. Um, and so the army is really changing its character. It's, it's commonly assumed in World War I that the, uh, that the only true attacking troops are, are men in their 20s. And that uh, when you go below that, or you go above that, you get a different caliber of recruit who's, uh, who can be counted on maybe to defend a trench but will never attack. And as somebody who's 56, I can attest to that fact. <clears throat> so France, in, over the entire course of World War I, they lose an average, a daily average of 900 killed and 2,300 wounded. I'm going to give you a sense of the scale of these casualties. 900 dead every day in the war. And the war lasts for 1,564 days, and 3,200, uh, and I'm sorry, and, and uh, 2,200 killed uh, every day. So in 1917, uh, France has this uh, smart new general named Robert Nivelle, and he has replaced uh, Joseph Joffre. Joffre was the guy, the the. the he was known as Papa Joff, the victor of the Marne. He, he, was the, he was the commander of the French army in 1914 until the end of 1916, and he orchestrated the big French victory at the Marne. And, uh, but he's fired after the Battle of Verdun at the end of 1916. And they bring in this guy, Robert Nivelle. Nivelle's younger, and he's more dynamic, and he says, I have a plan to win the war in 48 hours. So he pitches this massive offensive to uh, the French government. And, uh, and it has some basis in reality in that Nivelle had experimented during the 10-month-long Battle of Verdun where a half million are killed and wounded on, both si on, on each side, so a million total casualties in the Battle of Verdun. And he had, at the end of Verdun, he had experimented with these new tactics. So he's just going to apply them on a much bigger scale, and he says, I'm going to break through, and I'm going to encircle the German armies on the Western Front, and I'm either going to destroy them or force them to retreat into Germany. And, you know, the troops who are, the French troops who are, at this point, really sucking wind, and they're not happy about the war, and, they're, and, then, and after Verdun, the cauldron of Verdun, they, they need some relief, and they, and, they, and they are relieved. They're like, well, this guy knows what he's doing, we're going to win. Well, there's no underestimating the shock and the disappointment of the Nivelle Offensive because it fails utterly. If you go to the theater where it was waged, the Chemin des Dames, these limestone bluffs overlooking the N River, 
uh, north of Paris. Um, you, you know, you can go into these caverns that the Germans had carved. They were old mines uh, where they mined um, the, um, this uh, chalky stone that they used in construction. And the Germans just converted these mines into bunkers. And so this, you know, Nivelle had this heavy, heavy bombardment. And it did not penetrate these caverns, and the Germans were just in there, and they'd reinforced these caverns with steel and concrete. And when the French attacked, they mowed them down. And so uh, Nivelle had said, if, if, the, if it doesn't break through immediately, we're going to call it off. But then he pressed the attack, just hoping for some result. And the, and the, and the outcome was 200,000. French killed and wounded in an uh, offensive that was, had been dubbed a war winner. So the result was <clears throat> mutiny. Um, <clears throat> 49 of France's 113 divisions mutinied and said, we won't fight on. You know, we will defend our ground, but we will no longer attack. And, um, you know, they were like, you know, they were putting up signs in their trenches, down with the war. Um, we are men, not beasts. Ce cochon de Nivelle, this pig Nivelle. And so uh, onlookers in Britain, the United States, which was already, um, by the time of the Nivelle Offensive, the United States had just declared war on the German Empire. Uh, onlookers in America, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in Britain, were agreed that the attacking spirit of the French army had been utterly destroyed. The French army would never again attack in the war. Uh, that they would defend, but they would not be reliable attacking troops. And uh, so this begged the question, how, how, is, how, is, how are the Allies going to win? I mean, you have a French army that is effectively inert. You have a British army that, as we'll talk about in a second, is also dying. How are they going to win? The situation with the British army, uh, by at the end of 1917, the British Army has suffered two million casualties. And, um, you know, for the British, it was a very um, tragic situation. They had been, and it was full of meaning for the United States, which was coming into the war under the same auspices as the British had, with a very small regular army that they then have to, like, ratchet up into a big mass army very quickly. So the British had started the war with you know, an eight division army, 80,000 men. And then by, and, but then they, that, that army is wiped out in the first month of the war at battles like Mons and Le Cateau. So the British then have to embark on this massive program of creating a new army of volunteers and then ultimately draftees. So, uh, and, and building to a strength of 62 divisions on the Western Front. And that takes two years. So as a result, and this, this, this gets to the heavy French casualties in 1914-15, as well as the heavy British casualties, the British are constantly feeding these new sort of volunteers and recruits into the fire, and they're getting slaughtered. It's always one step forward, two steps back, because the pipeline wasn't full at the outset, so they're putting these hastily trained men into combat. And that accounts in all, also for their heavy casualties. It also means that there's severe civil military tension in London between David Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, and General Douglas Haig, the commander of the British armies. Lloyd George detests Haig because he sees, he says that Haig has smothered the army in mud and blood. He calls Haig the military Moloch, a Moloch being the Canaanite god who would consume his victims with fire. So the situation in Britain is that um, there are about 9 million men of military age in Britain that are not in uniform. And there are 25 British divisions that aren't on the Western Front. They're in places like Iraq, Palestine, uh, Suez, Macedonia. Um, and so the French are always saying to the British, you have all these men, what do you do? Why, why don't you put more divisions on the Western Front? You know, we've suffered so much, you know, waiting for you to build up this army. But Lloyd George won't send the troops because he says they'll be slaughtered by Haig. Haig has no answers. And Haig has this bad habit of launching these big offensives that he says are going to win the war. So the Battle of the Somme in 1916, Haig says this is a war winner. Unprecedented bombardment with artillery, 
that we're going to send these new divisions that we've created from, you know, volunteers in the draft. And um, gets nowhere at a cost of a half million casualties. Everybody knows the story of the first day and the sum, the bloodiest day in British military history, 60,000 killed and wounded on the first day. And then the battle extends another five months into November. And the British, you know, uh, end up losing a half million casualties. And then Passchendaele, 1917, Haig says we're going to break through the German line and clean up all the U-boat pens and rout the German army. And they spent 400,000 casualties at Passchendaele in 1917. Half the British uh, casualties arguably died in the mud, drowning in the mud that had been churned into this quicksand by uh, Hayes bombardment. So, you know, the uh, British who had been struggling to maintain 62 divisions on the Western Front in 1917, because again of the, of the relationship between Haig and, and, and Lloyd George, um, there, Haig is projecting in the course of 1917-18, he thinks his strength is going to dip to as little as 40 divisions, because he's not getting the replacements to replace his casualties, because uh, Lloyd George refuses to do so. So due to its inept strategy and tactics, the, the allies, the Entente, uh, you know, Britain, France, Russia, and, and then Italy starting in 1915. That was the, uh, the, on, the, the alliance was officially called the Entente. They had begun the war with a two million advantage. Two, they had an advantage of two million troops over the central powers. But they find themselves at the start of 1918 with no advantage at all. They had squandered this advantage of two million troops because of their inept operations and tactics. Now the Germans, meanwhile, they have, you know, at, at the st in 1917, they've got a, a, a hundred divisions on the Western Front against, uh, you know, 62 British divisions and uh, 100, 100 French divisions. And they've got a hundred divisions on the Eastern Front against the Russians. So they're looking at a situation where if they really do knock the Russians out of the war, and it looks like they are going to, they're going to be able to mass over 200 divisions on the Western Front. Plus, they're going to be able to mass huge amounts of artillery, an estimated 8,000 guns, for a war-winning push to destroy the British and French armies. And now they know the Americans have declared war in April of, of 1917, but the U.S., you know, the Army is so far from being ready, the U.S. is going to need at least a full year to, to deploy over to Europe with any kind of strength. So the Germans know they're going to have this window. They're going to have a window in early, in the first half of 1918, where they're going to be essentially unmolested by the Americans. And they're going to be able to basically deploy three million German and Austrian troops against um, a maximum of two million French and British troops. And they're going to have a decisive edge in artillery. And remember, in World War I, 80 to 90 percent of casualties are caused by artillery. So you bring the massive advantage in artillery, you're going to probably win. So that's why you, you see real panic in the Entente, as you know, 1917 turns to 1918. Uh, you know, you're looking at, here's, a, here's, a, here's an image of the, of the Russian army after the Kerensky offensive in the summer of 1917. This was touted as Kerensky was you know, that was the guy, the head of the provisional government that had replaced the czar and was going to introduce constitutional forms of government to Russia. He was a big friend of the United States. And so, and he's going to be loyal to the alliance and help beat the Germans and the Austrians and the Turks. And then look what happens to the Russian army. They literally dissolve. Uh, they've, been, they've been rotted out from within by the promises of the Bolsheviks under Lenin and Trotsky who were talking about, you know, uh, land, bread, and peace. Very simple program. And uh, so they just give up. And these are Russian troops, thro they've thrown away their rifles, and they're just like going home. These are Italians captured at Caporetto. And uh, you know, as I said, a quarter of a million Italian troops captured by the, uh, by, the, by, the, by the Germans and the Austrians at the Battle of Caporetto, along with 3,000 guns. They effectively disarmed the Italian army. 
Beautifully described, by the way, in Hemingway's Farewell to Arms. If you want to get like a, a, a real portrait, a beautifully written portrait of the Italian route at Caporetto, uh, read a Farewell to Arms. And the loss of 3,000 guns uh, had all kinds of knock-on effects. For example, the British, because of their manpower problems, their plan for 1918 was to beef up their dwindling army with much bigger numbers of artillery and tanks. But because of the, uh, of the, of the Italian losses at Caporetto, British factories now had to produce guns to replace the ones the Italians had surrendered to the Germans in the hopes of keeping the Italians in the fight. Notice, by the way, the uh, uniforms on the Germans, those coal scuttle helmets like you see in World War II. Uh, these, they're, these, these are stormtroopers. Um, these are the new tactics that they've devised in the course of 1917 that they're going to use to such uh, annihilating effect against the Allies. Here's the French army at the time of the mutiny. As I said, highest per capita casualties in the war, except for maybe Serbia. Serbia lost something like 70% of its adult male, po of its military age male population in the war. But among the great powers, this highest per capita casualties, France by 1917 is absolutely exhausted um, because of the casualties. And its best human material has been killed in the first two years of the war. So they're constantly you know, uh, going down and getting people that had, as I said earlier, had been classed as mentally or physically unfit for service. This is, these are British troops who've been gassed at Passchendaele in 1917. Uh, mustard gas attacks any moisture, so it would seek the eyes and burn them and blind you either temporarily or permanently. But as I said, the British manpower situation was such that there, there seemed to be, uh, you know, really no hope of beating the Germans in 1917 or 1918 because they, 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 they wouldn't have the manpower. And then, as I said, the Germans are preparing. These are the, these are the storm troops uh, demonstrating the new Houthier tactics. Houthier was a, is a German army commander who, who tried these tactics out for the first time uh, in Latvia in 1916, 17 when the Germans forced the passage of the Davina River and they took this big Russian fortress that uh, was considered impregnable and uh, be began the process of shortening their lines in the east so they could begin transferring troops to the west. The Houthier tactics basically involved, you know, the, the story in World War I until that point had been that uh, you, would, you would have, like, like Haig at the Somme, a week-long bombardment of the enemy with seven days of shelling where you would just pound their trenches for seven days and then at the end of seven days, you'd blow the whistle and the guys would go over the top and they would storm forward, hopefully to victory, but usually they'd be, they'd be annihilated because uh, the Germans just went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and they concreted everything and so they were able to ride out these bombardments and then emerge. So the Houthier tactics, they talk about, it's, it's all based on restoring surprise to the World War I battlefield. And, uh, which had, you know, the element of surprise had been totally lost because of these artfully choreographed battles. So you kind of knew uh, when the enemy was coming because they all followed the same plan. So Houthier tactics, uh, Houthier is H-U-T-I-E-R. That's the guy's last name. He was the general who pioneered these things in, in, uh, on the Eastern Front. And they bring these same tactics to Caporetto and then to the Western Front in the Ludendorff offensives. But essentially, you, uh, you mass artillery in unprecedented amounts stealthily. You do it at night when there's no aircraft up observing. Do it quietly. You muffle everything. And you, uh, you, you mass troops stealthily. You keep them like 30, you know, you bring them in again quietly. You hide them in woods. You hide them in barns. You keep them under cover. Um, and then you keep them like 30 miles from the point of attack, and then the night before, these guys will do like a 30-mile march in the night to get to the point of attack. And, uh, and they, have new, they have new weapons, lots of grenades, light machine guns. And then the uh, barrage by these guns is unprecedented ferocity. You know, they, uh, when they open up, first of all, you don't know they're there, concentrated in that kind of... Uh, Intensity when they open up, they just they they plaster the whole battle zone like basically five to ten miles in depth. They just like hit it with everything. Lots of heavy artillery. Lots of poison gas. Poison gas. You know the French say when you when you put on a gas mask, you're already two thirds defeated because you know you try to like figure out what's going on and fire your rifle when you've got a gas mask on. It's almost impossible. 
So the Germans will first they'll lead off with phosgene and mustard gas. So everybody's like on the floor of their dugouts, putting on respirators, can't see anything, can't do anything. Then they come in with a high explosive. They called it drum fire, trommelfeuer, because it was uh, the detonations were, were were so intense that it was like the beating of a snare drum. There was no uh, there was no break. If you if you read uh, Winston Churchill's history of World War One, he was actually on the front line, or, or not the front, but he's in the rear echelons of uh, one of the affected British armies when the Germans attacked in the West in March of 1918. And he describes it, it's a beautiful description. Where he says, you know, this is like nothing anybody had ever seen before. So that by the time the storm troops themselves go, I mean, the, the resistance has been destroyed by the artillery. And they get in there and they whoever survives the, uh, you see the dead French soldier there lying on the edge of the trench, you know, whoever survives that initial bombardment, these guys are in their trenches and inside their dugouts immediately putting grenades in there, stabbing people, clubbing people, machine gunning people. And the whole idea is that, you know, in World War I, you would take a trench, pause to regroup, the second wave would come up and sort of leapfrog you and advance to the next trench, pause to regroup, in these Houthier tactics, these stormtroop tactics, they keep going to the limit of their endurance. They don't pause and wait to be relieved. They keep going. Why? Because behind that, those first trenches are the headquarters and the artillery, the enemy headquarters and artillery. So the idea is you decapitate the enemy. You give the enemy a shot to the brain. You, you take away their headquarters, take away their communications, take away their artillery support, and the whole army will collapse. So this is what the Germans have already demonstrated against the Russians. That's how they beat the Russians, essentially. This is what they've already demonstrated against the Italians. That's how they beat the Italians and, this, and effectively knocked them out of the war. Um, and so there's, there's, there's panic in the Entente. And uh, that's why uh, you know, some of these things hadn't happened yet, but uh, they were already kind of foreshadowed by changes that were happening in warfare on the Eastern Front that they knew they were going to be brought to the Western Front. But the main, the, the main thing that had happened that was alarming to the Allies was the fact that Russia was probably going to drop out of the war. So in the spring of 1917, April, May 1917, France dispatches its most famous soldier, uh, to the United States. This is Papa Joffre, uh, you know, he's now Marshal Joseph Joffre, uh, Marshal of France. Um, and he, as I said, he'd been kicked upstairs after the, after the casualties at Verdun. France, you know, for, Verdun is a famous stalemate, fought in the entire length of 1916, but the casualties were so heartrending that the French government felt that they had to do a change of leadership, so they kick him upstairs into this kind of ceremonial role as a sort of soldier diplomat, and they put Nivelle in charge, and that doesn't work out so well. And while Nivelle's offensive is misfiring, Foch is, I'm sorry, Joff is in, um, is, in, is in New York, arguing for, you know, America has declared war, and he's there trying to figure out how quickly can we get American troops. So when I started the research for this book a couple of years ago, I was actually in Paris at the Chateau of Vincennes, which is where they keep the French army archives, and I found, that I found something that I've never seen related anywhere else, and that was the secret instructions given to uh, Marshal Joff by the French government for his visit in April, May, 1917. And these were, you know, elaborate instructions, but essentially, I'll, I'll quote from them. This is what the, 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 the French government says to Joff. English army at maximum strength and weakening. Italy, no use at all. French army resources exhausted. In 1917, France fights its last campaign at full power. Russian reserves of two million men may never be called due to revolution there. Only U.S. intervention can compensate for Russia's defeat and maintain the military power of the coalition. The American reservoir must replace the Russian reservoir. And then when I did some research in, in, uh, in London, and I found this in the Lloyd George papers in the Houses of Parliament archive. Morris Hankey, senior policy advisor to Lloyd George, tells the British War Cabinet in January 1918, only the Americans can deliver the knockout blow. Without the Americans, Hankey writes, only stalemates and an inconclusive and unstable peace. So everything hinged on the Americans. And uh, 
But the, the problem is, oh, and by the way, this, as I said, this is uh, Joff in New York. He, he went to New York, he went to Chicago, he went to St. Louis. He did this whole sort of, you know, whistle-stopping tour around the U.S. trying to whip up. And there was a great deal. Remember, France was regarded as our oldest ally at the time. They'd helped us in our revolution. There was a great deal of affection for France. There was not a great deal of affection for Britain uh, because of the big Irish populations on the East Coast and also the sense that Britain had meddled, you know, obviously in the revolution, the War of 1812, the Civil War, when Britain had sided with the Confederacy and sold commerce raiders and even sent British officers to serve in the Confederate Army. So there was a lot of bad blood toward the British, but not to the French. And you notice that's Leonard Wood sitting there, that general looking very pained. I don't know if you know anything about Leonard Wood, but Leonard Wood was a guy that was supposed to be like the head of the U.S. Army in, 19, in World War I. He was like America's most famous soldier. He'd been chief of staff of the Army under, uh, uh, he'd, been, he'd, been, he'd been named chief of staff of the Army under President William Howard Taft. Great friends with Teddy Roosevelt. Um, he was Roosevelt's choice uh, to, to be chief of staff and to obviously lead the AEF in World War I, but of course we had this little th problem of elections. Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat, first Democrat essentially since the Civil War, if you, if you don't count Grover Cleveland. Um, and so uh, you know, we have this Democrat in the White House for the first time in ages, and he sees Wood as a Republican general. So Wood gets nothing. Wood doesn't even go to France. He's the most famous, he was the most famous soldier in America in many ways. He doesn't even go to France in, in World War I. Because when he finally wangles command of a division, the 89th Division, in, in uh, mid-1918, and he's, he gets to the port of embarkation on the, in, in New York with his division, and he gets a, he gets a, a, tele, a telegram from the White House, you've been reassigned to to be commandant of Camp Funston in Kansas. <laughs> so he has to turn around and go all the way back after he finally got, got a division. He's finally going to France to fight. Uh, but that's Leonard Wood sitting there. And um, so the situation with the U.S. Army, which is going to be the, you know, which the people like um, uh, Marshal Joffre are seeing as the salvation of these weakening allies, it's not good. The strength of the U.S. Army in 1917, it's, like I said, it's, it's kind of parallels the case of Britain. Very small. Britain had always relied on a small army for sort of policing its colonies, home defense in an, in a, in a, in an absolute crisis, in the unlikely event that anybody was able to actually invade the British Isles given British sea power. Uh, so you had this small army for home defense or for policing colonies. And that was the same thing with the American, 120,000 man regular army. In, uh, in 1917, sized entirely for service in places like the Panama Canal Zone, Oahu, maybe fighting insurgents in the Philippines. Uh, but there was a sense that the U.S. Was, de is, is, was inherently defended by the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. As long as the U.S. Navy was strong, why do we need an army? So you had an army that uh, the strength of the U.S. Army was 120,000 regulars, 80,000 reservists, 8,000 Marines, so you have basically 208,000 troops. Add to that 400,000 National Guards. National Guards were like a joke, because every state was different. Remember, these, the National Guards, they, were, they derived from the militias of the Civil War, the state militias of the Civil War, and then they were sort of rendered permanent after the war. But National Guards officers were either appointed by the governor, were elected by their own troops. So, you know, the discipline was a joke, and uh, it was more like sort of a finishing school and a social network, uh, a way to escape a, uh, an unpleasant wife over the weekend and uh, that sort of thing. It was not regarded as militarily top-notch at all. So you take it all together, we had like 610,000 troops, maximal, maximal strength. This is at a time when our allies in Europe are wielding multi-million man armies against the 10 million troops of the Central Powers. And we're talking about maximum strength of 600,000 men. And then there's like the fact that no relevant experience whatsoever. I mean, here, this is uh, John J. Pershing, who's you know, leading the punitive expedition into Mexico in 1916-17, uh, in where you know, 10,000 U.S. troops are sent into Mexico to find Pancho Villa. And uh, 
who had raided Columbus, New Mexico and, and, and killed some Americans and, and taken a lot of stores and horses and stuff uh, to, cause he was, there was, Mexico at the time was undergoing a, a, a revol they, well, they had a sequence of revolutions in this period. And the U.S. had thrown his support behind Carranza, who was a rival of Villa. Villa had thought he had American support, so he goes in to, to punish the U.S. for supporting their rival. U.S. feels humiliated that a Mexican bandit, essentially, crosses the border and wreaks such havoc in New Mexico. So they send this punitive expedition, but it's a fiasco. They spend like a year milling around in Chihuahua State looking for Villa, and they're always like, five steps behind him because he's more elusive and he has the support of the population. And eventually like 125,000 American troops are rotated through. But they don't, they're not doing anything that has any, bears any resemblance to the fighting in Europe. I mean, they're basically just riding around or marching around these dusty roads looking for Pancho Villa and not finding him. So no relevant experience whatsoever. And the army's too small. So Congress, and the president passed the Selective Service Act. These are draftees from Oklahoma. And uh, the Selective Service Act, I mean, it's incredible what uh, Congress was able to do on, in, in very short order. Uh, they draft 24 million young men. The average age of a, of a U.S. recruit in World War I was 25, which is optimal. Again, we talked about what, what it takes to be attacking troops. Because at 25, you know, you're young enough to feel uh, immortal, and yet you're old enough to accept hardship and privations and discipline. So it's the optimal age. Younger is not good, and older is not good. You know, when you get older, you don't want to accept any of that stuff. <laughs> and um, 500,000 of these uh, young men were drafted in the summer of 1917, and a, uh, another 570,000 had been drafted and trained by May of 1918. So overall, the U.S. Army would have a million trained troops for a 1918 campaign. And everybody assumed that this war was going to drag on at least into 1919. And for that, we had three million, we had projected that we would have three million, and we in fact did have three million troops drafted and trained had there been a 1919 campaign. 90% of the officers who served in the war, of the U.S. officers who served in the war, entered the army in 1917 or 1918. And so this, this accounted for the very, uh, the very sharp amalgamation debate that um, was waged between Pershing, the, the head of the AEF, Haig, the head of the BEF, and Foch, the chief of staff of the French army. Uh, Foch and, and, and Pétain, Pétain, Marshal Pétain, or, or General Pétain at the time, was the, uh, was the commander-in-chief of the French army. Ferdinand Foch was the chief of staff. Foch and Pétain, and then Haig on the British side, they wanted all these young men to be delivered lock, stock, and barrel to the British or French armies for training and then for amalgamation into British and French divisions. Why? Because they said, you don't have the experience. You don't know what these what trench warfare is like. It's a very, it was a very uh, scientific process you know, where you had to, like, there had to be this incredible communication between the various arms, between aviation, artillery, infantry, and tanks, which were now emerging. Uh, so you had to have this incredibly elaborate system of communications between all the combat arms. Any mistakes would result in friendly fire losses, but also just you'd bog down in stalemate because you weren't be able to move kind of crisply forward. And this kind of experience, you, you know, the French and British had earned at the cost of, of literally millions of casualties. And they're like, you can't throw these guys into that cauldron. Just give them to us. Well, the Pershing and President Wilson insist on an independent U.S. Army. Uh, the pros of that, of course, were obvious, you know, national pride and having an independent U.S. Army that you could then wield at a peace conference after the war to gain maximum influence. The cons, obviously, were that you would suffer needless casualties. And, you know, U.S. casualties in the war, we have the highest daily rate of casualties in any war before or since, and in part because we rush into this war. We don't, we don't have the benefit of French and British experience. We make a lot of stupid mistakes and very high casualties. 
But it was regarded as, you know, Pershing always said, American, American troops will not fight under a foreign flag. They need to fight under the American flag. The, um, so, the, uh, so this is, these are the, we, 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 we pull these guys in. And, and by the way, interestingly, the Army is, uh, they, have, they suddenly have this huge pool of, uh, of new recruits. What to do with them? They create this new structure. Uh, called the National Army. So they take some of the draftees and they put them into the old regular army regiments and regular army divisions like the 1st Division, the Big Red One, the 2nd Division, 3rd Division, Rock of the Marne Division. Uh, they take some of them, they put them into the National Guard divisions. Generally, if you're drafted, say, in Oklahoma like these guys, you'll go into you know, either the, you know, the Texas Oklahoma National Guard Division or the Texas Oklahoma National Army Division. So they have this kind of tripartite division. And interestingly, in the course of the war, they all do pretty well. There's like the regular army divisions, the first, second, third, fourth, don't do any better than the, na than the better National Guard divisions. There's some bad National Guard divisions that never really find their way. But there's some great ones like the 42nd Rainbow Division, like the 28th Bucket of Blood Division. That's the Pennsylvania National Guard. 42nd was the one created by Douglas MacArthur because he was always a showman. And so he goes to the Secretary of War and goes, why don't we have this... Uh, National Guard Division has contingents from every state, and we'll call it like the rainbow because it'll spread across America like a rainbow. So the 42nd Rainbow, like Wild Bill Donovan is in that unit. They have some of the heaviest fighting, and they're really good. The point being that they ended up uh, creating a whole new structure, National Army, to catch as sort of a catch basin for all these draftees, and then they put other ones into the Guard Divisions, and they put other ones into the regular Army Divisions, and they all perform pretty well. It's a bit of a miracle of improvisation on very short notice. Um, so, so any, anyway, it, the, the, this long-awaited German attack finally happens, and um, the Germans nearly destroy the uh, British and French armies in, this, in these three offensives. Um, oh, there, why, why is it not? It, for some reason, doesn't ever show up there. But anyway, uh, the. the if you look at, if you see on the map this big bulge where it says Mont Didier, that's Operation Michael in March of 1918, where the Germans, uh, they, that's, that, that's striking close to Amiens. Amiens on the Somme River there, that is the hinge between the British and French armies, essential junction. The, the roads and the rails there are critical so that the two armies can cooperate, they can shift reserves between the threatened fronts. The Germans strike right into that gap, and they nearly break through, they destroy an entire British army. An entire British army is destroyed in the March offensive. In April they shift up to the north there, Armentier, and they, in Flanders, and, they, and they, that's Operation Georgette, and they chew up another British army there, and the idea being they're going to break through to the sea, and they're going to take Calais, and they're going to take the other channel ports. They're going to cut the BE off from, BEF off from England. They nearly break through. Um, and then in uh, May, June, down here, the uh, Chateau Thierry, this, this area down here, they launch an offensive which they hope will be... Uh, uh, a big diversion that will draw all the reserves that Foch has sent up to assist Haig during Operation Georgette. It will, he'll, have to, he'll have to shift all the reserves from Flanders back down there so that he can then resume his attack and drive the British into the sea. But it's, it turns out that this, this, is the, uh, the, this is called Operation Blucher, and it turns out to be a stunning success. The Germans take Soissons, which you can see on the map there, which is a, a junction almost as important as Amiens. So they suddenly have this, like, this big knot of railways, which they can then use to sort of widen their offensive. And they chew up 50 French divisions. 50 French divisions. And now they're 50, they get all the way down to Chateau Thierry, which is just 50 miles from Paris. And uh, so this is like the crisis of the war. And for the first time, the Americans, in, 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 the, the Americans intervene in large numbers. And you, because in the situation, France is, it looks like it's gonna, gonna fall out of the war here. You've got 70 German divisions in this space against 30 French divisions, and they're poised to hit Paris. And this is when, you know, the Americans intervene in places like Belleau Wood, Chateau Thierry, which people think are just, were just, you know, 
These were relatively small actions by small numbers of Americans in concert with the French. No, these were critical actions. We had eight U.S. divisions deployed. And remember, eight U.S. divisions, US divisions in World War I were ridiculously large, 28,000 men. Why? Because we had no officers. So we had to pack all these guys into these like, you know, ridiculously large divisions. This is like, this, you know, this is about uh, eight U.S. divisions would be the manpower equivalent of 25 to 30 French divisions. So we send them into places like Chateau Thierry, <coughs> Below Wood. Below Wood is, the, is like right, it's in this space here, Below Wood. And it was like the Germans were trying to push that, this, this pocket out so they could have a broad front advance on Paris. So Below Wood, which is a 19-day battle <coughs> in June of 1918, where the Marines go in and suffer 9,000 casualties, stopping the German advance, critical battle. <coughs> and here you have a picture of um, Marines in um, Below Wood. <coughs> Excuse me. So the Americans were uh, absolutely key players in stopping the German drive on Paris in June and July of, uh, of 1918 at Below Wood, at Chateau, at Chateau Thierry. And then this, there's, there was one final offensive here. In July, this was the, this was the, the, the Germans called it the peace offensive, the, the, the Friedensturm, uh, where they were going to take Reims. Reims is the, uh, was like the most important rail hub of all. And uh, Americans, the, the Rainbow Division, Bucket of Blood Division, Big Red One, the, uh, the Second Division, all weighed in mightily to stop that, that German thrust in uh, July of 1918, which was the last major German offensive and then Foch, the Allied Generalissimo, decides the Germans are overextended. Oh, good, okay. And he said the Germans are overextended and that uh, they're ripe for a counteroffensive. And so the Americans are in the leading edge of this big Allied counteroffensive that jumps off in July of 1918 at, at, at Soissons. And the big red one, the first division, the second division, between the two of them, they lose 15,000 men in this counteroffensive. So they bring this critical manpower um, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the summer of 1918, allowing the Allies actually to contemplate a counteroffensive and, 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 and a defeat of the Germans. The Allies, absent this American power, that wouldn't have happened. And then finally, I just want to talk about the. Um, um, the key importance of the uh, Meuse-Argonne battlefield, because this is where America really makes its vital, most vital contribution. First, keeping the French alive uh, at Belleau Wood and Chateau Thierry, and then at Soissons. But the Meuse-Argonne battlefield is the is the critical space. Uh, analysts at the time called it the vital pivot of the German war effort. The Germans called it the solar plexus of their war effort on the West Front. Why? Because there was this railway from Metz to uh, Metz, uh, you see Metz right there, and then Bruges up there, if you went all the, way up, all the way up into the top corner of the map, you'd hit Bruges. That, was the, that, that single railway, which was four-tracked in some sections, had half the supply and troop moving power of the German army in occupied France and Belgium. Half of the troop moving and supply was on that railway from Metz up to Bruges. You see, you can see, uh, well, um, there we go. Here's Metz, and then Bruges is up here. So this railway here was between, you know, Metz to, Sedan, and then the section in here, Sedan to Montmédy. I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, four, six tracks, uh, parallel tracks. They've got everything moving on. Like half of the logistical capability of the Germans is on that one railway. So the Meuse-Argonne battlefield was chosen by the Americans in part because they can then thrust up from the region, you know, from, you can see the, the line of departure there. From around Verdun, they can thrust northward, take Sedan, remove that railway from German hands, and either destroy the ability of the Germans to move troops or reserves or bag the whole German army by encircling them there, trapping them there. Now, this had occurred to everybody, everybody in the war, the British, the French, 
The French had launched attacks in, this had been French territory until 1914 when in the initial German invasion culminating in the Battle of the Marne, the Germans had taken that ground and then, and then built these, uh, these really artful fortifications to defending it because it was so critical. Um, you know, because that was, if you could attack across that narrow space, you could cut the main German lifeline into France. So they built this extension of the Hindenburg Line through the Meuse-Argonne battlefield called the Kriemhilde Stellung. The Kriemhilde Stellung was, uh, it was like a 10 miles deep zone with three bands of, of fortifications, concreted bunkers with machine gun openings, uh, defilated artillery, you know, trenches all reinforced with wood and concrete and steel, uh, it, was, it was regarded as one of the most redoubtable sections of the uh, Hindenburg Line. The, British, the French had attacked it in 1914, 1915, some of their, their bloodiest offensives, all repulsed by the Germans. After, after 1916, they never try again. They see it as being impossible. But because the Americans bring a million troops in, for a campaign in 1918, they actually have the manpower to attempt it. And uh, <clears throat> so the... Uh, in the, battle of the, in the Battle of the Meuse-Argonne, the U.S. Uh, basically draws 40 German divisions into this, uh, into this area, which greatly facilitates Allied progress further west. So when you look at, uh, when you look at the, the Allied, the British breaching of the uh, Hindenburg Line and stuff, a lot of that is facilitated by the American attack in the Meuse-Argonne, which forces the Germans to retreat uh, from their positions further west and keep pulling back to this um, Antwerp Meuse line, which is uh, th this line here is the one that runs through Sedan, where the Americans are going to basically come in behind. We're going to basically attack through the Meuse Argonne, get on both banks. We're going to cross to this side of the Meuse, which the Germans are saying nobody crosses the Meuse. We actually cross on November 6th, we cross the Meuse. Germany puts its last reserve division in to try to stop us crossing the Meuse at a little place called Dunn, south of Sedan. Once we're across the Meuse and we bring more divisions across, we literally are in a position to capture a million German troops and all of their materiel. This is one of those things when I say fresh perspective. This is people don't know. People, is, well, Trump always says that. People don't know that Lincoln was Republican. But no, but people don't know that, like, that um, how, how critical the U.S. hand in this war was. The British and French were never going to drive the Germans off that Antwerp Meuse line with, with their... Uh, with, with, the, with the manpower situation they were suffering under. It took the American army to do it. And so I have to finish because um, I just want to, I want to finish by just reading something really quickly that uh, these, are, these are American doughboys, you know, American soldiers at, at the Battle of San Miel. And, um, you know, Haig, after the war, he said, he wrote this, this, this memo, that, which was published in the Pall Mall Gazette, and he said this was a miracle, that the war ended in 1918 and that we won it, given all the things that were going wrong that I talked about earlier. And I'd say, yes, it was a miracle. It was an American miracle. It was owed to this very rapid sort of mobilization, deployment, and a very quick, if crude, ascent of the learning curve. Um, you know, the British and French were struggling to maintain 60 and 100 divisions respectively. We sent the manpower equivalent of 160 French and British divisions, and it's pretty clear who won the war. And I think we should be awed by these young men. Edward Streeter, who wrote these, they were called the Dear Mabel letters, Dear, D-E-R-E, -E, Mabel, M-A-B-L-E, Dear Mabel, you know, getting again to the the, 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 the sort of low education of your average recruit in World War I. Imagine the average schooling of a white American recruit, of a, of a white native born American recruit in World War I was 6.9 years of schooling. Average schooling of a white immigrant, recent immigrant recruit. Uh, and remember, we drafted, we drafted green card holders, we, we, non-citizens because cities like New York and Boston had so many immigrants that they were like, we can't draft just like the citizens because then all the immigrants will take their jobs. So we drafted immigrants without, that, were, that were still like citizens of Italy or Austria-Hungary. Um, that's why if you go to the American war cemeteries and they have all these names like Pantaleon Lebinsky, this guy had just arrived from Russia. Uh, so the immigrant, their average education was four years. 
The 300,000 African-American troops were drafted and used in the war. Average schooling for African-American troops, two years. So that's why Dear Mabel, D-E-R-E. But this is what Streeter was like, the Willie and Joe verse of World War I. This is what Streeter, after the war, wrote about the, you know, how he summarized the, the doughboy, the American soldier. That strange mixture of discontent and cheerfulness, stubbornness under discipline, and tractability under leadership, sentimentalism and repression, garrulous incoherence, the Doughboys, Streeter continued, were men used to taking things as they find them, vaguely understanding, caring less, grumbling by custom, cheerful by nature, ever anxious to be where they are not, ever anxious to be somewhere else when they get there. Without thought of sacrifice, they've left the flag waving to those at home. They serve as a matter of course. Thank you very much. We really only have time for about one question, so make it a really good one, please, and wait for a microphone since we're videotaping this. The bulk of the American expeditionary force was in the Musargun Valley, a little bit to the left was the 36th. Uh, it spent most of the war there in training. How many German divisions shifted from in front of the British and in front of the French 4th to be in front of the American army during the last two months of the war? Well, that is a great question. And that was uh, how people analyzed operations then, is like, you know, what's the situation uh, with reserves? How many do they have? How many do we have? Where are their reserves? And, and, as, and because of the emphasis on stealth and deception, remember all these armies, they operate under canopies of brush and camouflage and they would camouflage their movements during the day by covering their roads and they would do most of their movements at night and they would hide everything. So nobody could ever say. And then the Americans always claimed that there were more German divisions against them than there actually were. The French and British doing the same on their side. But it's estimated that the Americans pinned down 40 German divisions in the, in the course of the Battle of the Meuse-Argonne. And, and more importantly, first-rate German divisions. By this stage of the war, divisions were classed, you know, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Fifth-rate German divisions or Austro-Hungarian divisions were effectively useless. They were people that would only be used to garrison forts, you know, uh, you know essentially like old Lanvair or Landsturm troops. First-rate were the people that were still of the right age and the right level of training and fitness. And they, so we had, a, 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 we had 40 first-class German divisions against us in the Meuse-Argonne. And this was... Uh, and again, they were fighting uh, in this battlefield that had been carved into this Kriemhilde Stellung. It was the eastern extension of the Hindenburg Line. And you can go there today. If you go to, uh, the, the, if you visit the battlefield today, you'll see these German bunkers still there. And, uh, you know, a a absolutely, uh, you know, as one of the Doughboys said, every, every goddamn German there that didn't have a machine gun had a cannon. You know, I mean, it was very heavily fortified and the casualties were monstrous. Uh, we had the highest daily rate of casualties in our history. Uh, it was like 36, 30, uh, I'm sorry, it was the, month, the highest monthly, coverage, uh, monthly casualties, 36,000 U.S. casualties a month during our participation in World War I, whereas the, the, the monthly average in World War II was 6,000 a month. Cap, one more question over here. Money, makes to, money seems to make the world go round. I know that um, during the war we were making, our central bankers were making massive loans to the Entente. And with the Entente threatening to collapse, what in your opinion was the politics of finance pressure for our politicians to come in on the side of the Entente to uh, make sure those uh, war loans were repaid? Yeah. Um, well, there, there, was that, there was something to that, and uh, you know, we passed something called the uh, Espionage, Espionage Act and the Sedition Act, and journalists were actually jailed for arguing that you know, this was Morgan's War, J.P. Morgan's War, and that uh, the U.S. was going to be on the hook, and so the U.S. had to... It's, it's unclear. Um, imagine, though, the U.S. spent uh, $50 million every day on the war, uh, 
at the time of, by the time we embarked on the Battle of the Meuse Argonne in 1918, we'd already spent $12.5 billion. Some of this was, uh, had been, was factoring the private lending, but most of it was you know, federal lending and, uh, and, and loan drives. We, so we had spent, in, in the, by mid-1918, we'd spent $200 billion on the war. There's no question that that infusion of capital wasn't as vital as the manpower in terms of because the, uh, the French and the British had exhausted their sources. They'd given all their shares and all their gold as collateral to the U.S. banks for the loans in 1914-15, and they were basically tapped out. And so in comes the rich uncle of the United States, and we had all this, this slack. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we intervened to bail out the bankers. No, I would say that... Uh, we looked at this situation strategically, politically, and uh, I talk in the early chapters of my book about the German threat to American primacy in the Western Hemisphere. The Germans were kind of, were trying to get into Mexico, the Germans were trying to get into the Central American Republics, the Germans are trying to get into Brazil, the Germans are trying to get into Argentina and Chile. They're threatening the Monroe Doctrine, they're threatening predominance in Latin America and the Caribbean but also all over the world. The Germans were the only country that could compete with us economically. Our economies of scale were invincible, and the Germans they were doing, even then, what, they're, what they do or what they're doing now, their emphasis on technology and quality was the only formula that was proving successful against American mass. So I think we, for all kinds of reasons, we saw it was essential to defeat the German Empire and not let them permanently tilt the balance of power. We're going to have to cut off there for our next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that was a perfect segue into our next speaker, Germany trying to get into Mexico.